Thanks very much, Emma. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our webinar um, this morning or this afternoon, wherever you are um, in the world at the moment. So my name is Melissa Cunningham. I'm the Senior International Recruitment Officer here at the University of Strathclyde. So I work in the international office and I look after North and Latin American students who are interested in coming to study at Strathclyde. So I'm going to give everyone a little 10 minute or so overview of who we are at Strathclyde. All right, Emma, if you want to go into the next slide for me, thanks. Perfect. So for those of you who maybe aren't quite aware of the University of Strathclyde. Um, we are quite an old institution. We were established over 200 years ago at the end of the Scottish Enlightenment in 1796. And we were established as a place of useful learning. Um, that's our ethos. And it goes back to um, our founder, John Anderson, really wanting to establish an institution um, for people to come and learn and use the skill set and use um, use the useful skill set skill sets into the wider world so that's something that we always go back to we want to make sure that there are lots of opportunities for our students um, to get involved in our industry connections and um, practical experiences as well and to take all of these skill sets into a real life setting into the working world we're quite a big institution we have over 23,000 students and quite a diverse student population. So we have students from over 100 different countries around the world. You can see here a lot of accolades. We are very proud of these, all of these awards that we have won over the past couple of years. In particular, to highlight the Times Higher Education UK University of the Year, which we won in 2019. And we also won this award in 2012. So we are currently the only, un the only university in the UK to have won this award twice now, which is really excellent. We've also been named Scottish University of the Year in recent, in recent years. And um, one of the most prestigious prizes in the higher education sector, which we have won, is the Queen's Anniversary Prize. We've actually won this award twice now. So this is an award that's given to um, a few universities every two years. And we have won this award um, twice consecutively now for energy innovation and advanced manufacturing. Um, so really pleased with that. And in actual fact, our principal has um, had to go down to Buckingham Palace in London to actually collect this award. So really prestigious prize here. Um, and it's really refre reflective of the growth that Strathclyde has in the industry um, sector. I think probably one of the one of the awards that we're most proud of is um, student satisfaction and that's really what it's all about. So our students in a recent analysis of the 2021 National Student Survey have voted as fifth in the UK for student satisfaction. And again, um, different realms of what students vote on are teaching, experience and um, facilities on campus and um, graduate opportunities as well and um, graduate rates too so again these are all points that have contributed um, to us being really high in the student satisfaction survey and again as i said it all goes back to making sure that we have a well-rounded excellent experience for students okay emma thank you So whereabouts are we? For those of you who maybe have not had the opportunity to come to Scotland before and you're very curious to find out where we are, we are in fact located in the biggest city in Scotland, which is Glasgow. So Glasgow is about a 45 minute bus or train ride from the capital city, Edinburgh. Um, so Scotland itself anyway, we're, we're quite a small country. We're a population of about 5.3 million. So as you can imagine, very easy to, to get around, um, not just in Scotland, but indeed in other nations in the UK as well. We have excellent transportation links. And indeed Glasgow itself, we have an international airport, which is 20 minutes outside of the city. Um, and we, if you're, if you're coming from North America, for example, you can easily cross over from any of the major um, hubs in North America 
and um, you can fly to London and then from London Glasgow is only an hour flight up the road there. In terms of the campus, so the campus is situated in the downtown area of Glasgow um, and again Glasgow is a very walkable city so everything is in the one area, you do not necessarily need to have a car or indeed transport to get around, everything is pretty much easily accessible. And we do have main bus and train stations as well in and around the city. So again, really great transportation links to get to all the major towns and cities in and around the UK. Glasgow itself is a really vibrant city, so there's lots going on. It is quite a big student city as well. We have a number of other universities located in and, in and around Glasgow. And um, we are known in particular for world class shopping and nightlife and um, our music scene as well, which is reflected in the fact that we are UNESCO City of Music. We have over 130 gigs and concerts per week, which is an amazing feat. So it doesn't matter what you're interested in, the type of music styles or, or genres, there is something for everyone. Um, you can actually see here just in the, the photographs. Um, it's quite nice to demonstrate the nice kind of Gothic um, and Victorian architecture in the city. Um, some of our museums as well. All of our museums are um, free um, entry, so the, the admissions are subs subsidised by the government. So it's really good. Students always comment on that in between classes or if they have some downtime. There are loads of different um, art museums, um, historical museums that students can go and visit free of charge. Um, and the little kind of, I like to call it the little kind of spaceship in the middle photograph there, that's our biggest music venue. It has a 13,000 seat capacity, it's called the Hydro. And fun fact, actually, it's, it's the second busiest um, music event in the world to Madison Square Garden. So second in respect of ticket sales. So loads goes on there and it hosts major sporting events as well and you can see here Glasgow has been host to a number of different sporting events from the Commonwealth Games to the European Championships a few years ago. One other point just to make on that is that if you have been to Scotland before I hope you will attest to this we are um, a very friendly bunch of people and in particular Glasgow over the years um, our, our Glaswegians our local population has been voted world's friendliest city. So we love to welcome different people from all over the world in the city. We're very interested to find out where people are coming from. And we are a very helpful people as well. If you need to find out where to go or any directions or anything like that, don't be afraid to ask. Um, we are very um, helpful and friendly. And I'm sure as well our students will, will chat about that during the student panel later on. Okay, Emma. Thank you. This is great, actually. Thanks, Emma. So this is what I was I was um, talking about in terms of our campus and location. So we're quite a centralised campus in the downtown area. So basically, you can see here highlighted um, that all of our buildings are in the same the one area, and it takes maybe five to ten minutes walk to get from one end of the campus to the other. So everything itself is really accessible. We have on-campus housing for undergraduate students within our campus too. And there are loads of amenities around the campus. So supermarkets to buy, to buy your food, um, five to 10 minute walk from the main shopping areas as well, and main bus and train stations too. Okay, Emma. So in, just in terms of the university itself, you'll see from these photographs that um, we there's quite a lot of new buildings that have popped up in and around the campus in recent years. And this all goes back to um, campus investment. We are at the moment pretty much um, on par to have invested £1 billion by 2025 into um, renovating and rejuvenating the campus. Um, there are lots more state-of-the-art facilities which students can avail of. A couple in particular are our Strathclyde Sports Centre. So that's the, the photograph up at the top there. You can see this is a £31 million state-of-the-art facility that was opened a couple of years ago. 
and it has everything that you 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 would need in terms of um there's a 25 meter swimming pool all state-of-the-art um facilities gym equipment lots of different classes that go on there and um, our sports union is affiliated within Strathclyde Sports too. Our technology and innovation centre, which um, is featured in the middle photograph there. Um, so that's really a space that was created um, by industry, for industry. A lot of our academics um, and organisations collaborate within this building. And there are opportunities as well for um, students to avail of these opportunities too. Our library has been recently renovated, lots of refurbished study areas within the library and our new learning and teaching building, which is at the bottom photograph there, that opened, that's a 60 million pounds um, investment and that opened just last year in September. It's basically a one-stop shop for students. So all of our student support facilities are based in this building. Um, as well as that, uh, we have bars and cafes as well, places for students to hang out, and also some nice classrooms as well. Okay, Emma, next slide, please. And over to you, I think, Emma. Over to myself. Thank you very much, Melissa. So the Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences, we're made up of six schools in total, the School of Education, Government and Public Policy, which includes our politics and international relations courses, um, School of Humanity, which covers creative writing, diplomacy, English, history, journalism, media communication, modern languages, our Strathclyde Law School, School of Psychological Sciences and Health, and the School of Social Work and Social Policy. So our subject rankings, so we're really delighted that we've done so well in the recent subject rankings. So we've got eight subjects in the top 10 in the Sunday Times Good University Guide 2020, including politics, which is coming at number eight. And again, we've got eight subjects in the top 10 in the Complete University Guide 2020, including politics, which comes in at 10th. So the application process for our, all our postgraduate top programmes is really easy and straightforward. Once you've decided the course you want to apply for, there's an apply link on each of our course pages, which takes you through to our online application form. There's no application fee, it is free to apply for our postgraduate courses. Um, the entry requirements require you to have a first or second class honours degree or international equivalent. Although entry may be possible with other qualifications or if you have substantial professional experience. If English isn't your first language, then you also need to provide evidence of language proficiency. Uh, we do have a dedicated um, selection team that will be able to help you if you have any questions regarding your application form. So fees and funding, our master's tuition fees start from 16,000, but this may vary from course to course. So we would strongly recommend you check the website and the individual courses for their tuition fees. Um, international students are eligible for faculty scholarships. We are hopefully going to be introducing an international scholarship with a 20% discount and further information on that will be given on our website as soon as possible. Um, again, we've got a scholarship search engine on the website and you can go on there and you can search for um, scholarships which you may be eligible for. And finally, our career service. So our career service are here to support you throughout your time at Strathclyde University, and they also continue to support you five years after graduation. You can prepare in advance with their international pre-arrival module. Uh, My Career Hub advertises graduate and internship roles. Um, you can also meet employers at their careers fairs and recruitment events. Um, they have recruitment support and resources and sessions that cover topics such as applications, interviews, assessment centres and psychometric testing. You can have your CV and application checking services available to you and they also provide a one-to-one -one confidential careers guidance appointments. I'm now going to hand over to Dr. Mark Shepherd, and he's going to talk to you now about um, the School of Government and Public Policy and what's available to you. Hello, my name's uh, Dr. Mark Shepherd from the School of Government and Public Policy. 
And we've already seen that we um, are scoring quite well um, in for politics and we are on the way up and have been on the way up. And we're, we do very well for both teaching and also for research. So we are quite a research intensive university, but what's really good about our MSc programs is they are still quite small in comparison with other top rated universities. So we have quite small numbers of students in our classes. And that's one of the um, things that does come back we do get very good positive feedback about that in terms of the hands-on experiences that students have with members of staff. So we are quite small uh, and we do quite well for teaching. We do very well for teaching and research. We have two research centers, the European Policies Research Center and the Center for Energy Policy. And our main research strengths are parties, elections and public opinion, political economy and public policy, political institutions, and world politics, we've got increasingly a lot of uh, staff from uh, around the world um, with specialist areas in both the UK, um, that includes Scotland uh, and, and British politics as well, and EU, USA, Asia, Latin America and Africa. We're also uh, growing our international relations and international organizations uh, programs, and we have a number of staff, um, excellent staff in that particular area. Uh, next one. Emma. So we have a range of programs for you to pick from. Um, all of them are September starts. Uh, so it would be kind of towards the end of September is when we would get going. Um, we'd have an introduction week uh, and a range of activities there to get you settled in. We have an MSc in international relations. Um, we are thinking of moving also. We're having a 2023, 2023 for the public policy and the international relations January start, but mainly for international students, it will be the September start. International relations, politics, political research, public policy. I have um, a range of handbooks here. We do provide um, um, an overview on the website of each of these courses, but if you, if you need further information or you want to know in more depth about what we cover, I do have handbooks uh, available for each of these uh, MSc programs if you want to find out more information on these, we also offer, <clears throat> so the main programs there are with the School of Government and Public Policy, which is politics and IR. And then the interdisciplinary programs, uh, we, uh, we teach these MSc programs in conjunction with other um, units and other schools within the university. So for example, the MSc in Data Science, Politics and Policymaking, uh, we teach in conjunction with the Computer Science School uh, and then we have the MSc in Technology Policy and Management and the MSc in Urban Policy and Analysis. And they pick up some really cool connections with uh, the engineering department, uh, economics. There's lots of different courses that fit into those to make them, as we mentioned at the outset, it's all about trying to give you the skills uh, that the job market requires. So it's a, we are very much always thinking about the job market and giving you the skills. So we are the place of useful learning. And the MSc in data science is proving very popular, um, as is international relations, public policy, political research, and the others are growing, um, but we're doing very well on those. So hopefully there's a lot there for you to choose from. Um, the MSc in politics provides quite a lot of choice. Um, many of the other um, options there, like MSc in data science, are quite quantitative. And I was trained in the United States. I did my PhD at the University of Houston. And when I got a job at Strathclyde, we were, we were renowned for being one of the places, a, a really good university that you would go to uh, once you've been trained um, in the US. So we've got a lot of really cool courses there. If you find that quants really isn't for you, like the MSc in data science, you can always, have, there's a lot more flexibility and we offer more qualitative or mixed methods research. Uh, and you can go down a complete qualitative route if you want to do the MSc in politics, for example. So we've got a lot of flexibility contingent upon your research needs and what you actually want. How a, how a typical uh, semester would work is you'd take three classes, each class would be 20 credits. Uh, in the MSc Data Science, there are some uh, shorter programs, 10 credit classes. And so there are a few more little components in that particular program. But most of our programs, uh, it, you're thinking about three classes a semester. And there's typically about 10 weeks in a semester of teaching contact time. Uh, and then there's normally a couple of weeks where you're working on assessments uh, towards the end. 
And then in semester two, January to April, again, three times 20 credit classes. And then, so that adds up to 60 plus 60 is 120. You need 180 credits. The extra 60 credits comes from the dissertation, which um, you will work on independently from kind of June to August. From January to May, you will be working with your dissertation supervisor to um, uh, affect what you had worked on in semester one in the principles of research design class. Most students will take the principles of research design class, which is quite nice because everyone gets to socialize together and you get to see all the other students who are in all the different programs. And what you're doing is you're working on the dissertation proposals. We do poster sessions. It's, it's quite a nice um, social uh, time. And then the semester two, as I say, there's dissertation supervision and May to August, you'll be doing your independent study on the dissertation to finish that up. Emma. Excellent, thanks. We, with the MSc in data science, there are a number of um, scholarships we get each year. Um, we have got, I've just found out this morning that we have a number of scholarships been awarded to us. I think that's four. So you um, do look at the scholarship page because this changes week by week. So see what is available to you. If something is not available to you in one week, it might be available to you in the next week. So we have yet to put that information out, I believe, because it just came in this morning. But we do have that the MSc in Data Science Scholarship there, scholarship students are eligible for placement uh, dissertations. And it is competitive to get one, but um, we have had um, a few successes in the past. We will also work with you with um, external organisations to try and connect you to organisations uh, that reflect your interests. So if you do want to, uh, we will use our networks and try and uh, ensure that we can connect you to any organization if you wanted to work with an external organization to secure data, to work on something that would be of use to both you and the organization, again, reflecting that need to be the place of useful um, learning. You don't have to do that. A lot of students will either have their own uh, data that they've got through their own workplaces if they're coming in from workplaces or uh, they will pick up on data sets that we've been using in class and they'll come up with their own, own creative work or they'll, or they'll create their own data sets uh, given the plethora of different things that we cover uh, and, and students can do that. So what we're trying to do ultimately with that dissertation is hopefully produce something that's of use to both you and the outside world, and also um, give you a chance to hone your skills that you learn. We have a lot of research classes um, that give you a lot of skills for your future CV and the, and the job market once you leave with the MSc. The really good thing about doing an MSc in the UK compared with many other countries um, is that it's one year. So you don't have to devote two years of your life to this. It is quite intensive, but you can get it done in one year, which is often one of the big draws and attractions of doing an MSc in the UK. Emma. As to career opportunities, um, if you look at www.prospects.ac.uk, for example, um, you will notice that this, I love spending time on this. You can just go through and see all these different jobs and they give job, job titles, job descriptions. And about 60% of the jobs that are listed there, you're eligible for uh, by doing an MSc uh, in, in politics or in the social sciences. And common careers might include civil service, uh, parliaments or legislatures, state legislatures, for example, or you know, even Congress, media, marketing and PR, teaching and education, research posts, um, business, charity and voluntary sector. So there's lots of things there that you might end up doing that many of our students have done, you know, one went to work for the Brazilian uh, Grand Prix. So there's lots of stuff that our students end up doing uh, and it's really nice to hear back from them. We have our own alumni network as well on LinkedIn as well. And I've just been posting there today um, job opportunities for students who have graduated. So as well as the careers service, we also have our own alumni network and we'll try and make you aware of uh, anything that might be of interest to you. Emma, that's, I think that's me, is it? That's great. Thank you very much. Thank you for Thank your you time much. today and joining us. I'm now going to hand over to Dr. Regalia Pastor, Pastor Castro, who is going to give you an overview of our Diplomacy and International Security Programme. Thank you. Thank you, Emma. 
Um, yes, I'm the program director for the MSc in Diplomacy and International Security here at Strathclyde. And it's a distinctive program because it brings together academic expertise within the Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences. So we have colleagues from history, politics and law contributing to this program. And this master's also provides a unique opportunity for students to engage with diplomats and foreign policy practitioners. Now, of course, diplomacy and international security are among the most pressing issues facing the world today. Success and failure can have enormous impact on the international community and societies. And our core classes equip students with an in-depth knowledge of diplomacy theory and practice. And they also offer a historical understanding of contemporary security issues. Now, our students come from a wide range of backgrounds and disciplines. Some students have studied history, politics or law, but we also have students from other subjects in the humanities and social sciences. We have students who come to us from modern languages, journalism, business studies, etc. So our core classes really aim to equip everyone with an essential grounding in diplomacy and sort of security issues. We look at the evolution of diplomacy, the role of embassies, foreign ministries, as well as multilateral organizations. We examine the role of women in diplomacy, uh, what digital diplomacy means today. And we also have classes that focus on symmetry and negotiations, for example. Now, the other core class is embassies in crisis. And of course, embassies are integral to international diplomacy, and they're also instrumental in intergovernmental dialogue, trading relationships, and cultural exchanges. But embassies can also be targets of protests and sites of confrontation. In times of international tensions, health or environmental crisis, embassies around the world are called to intervene and to respond. So this class provides a historical context to a number of crises in Middle East, Asia, Europe. It explores aspects of crisis management, and also it explores the link uh, between diplomacy and security. So those are our sort of core classes for everyone to take. Now, we have option classes from history, politics and law, and this allows you to sort of shape your curriculum according to your interests. And so students have the opportunity to select three option classes. Now, some students enjoy the multidisciplinary aspect of this program, and they select one class uh, from each area for history, politics and law. Some students prefer to take all their classes from one discipline in particular, and that's also fine. So basically what this is what students find attractive about the program, that it's flexible and sort of they can shape it according to their interests. Now you can see a few examples of our option classes here. You can see classes that obviously cover the Middle East, conflict resolution in the Middle East, um, Cold War in Africa or European integration. Uh, from politics, you can take some classes on international security, international relations, international institutions and regimes. Or from law, there are classes on international human rights law negotiation, for example. So these are just some examples uh, from the range of classes that are available to students taking this program. Now, as you've been hearing, dissertations are an important part of the master's programs here at Strathclyde. And in semester one, students take the research uh, class uh, to prepare them for the dissertation. Uh, students are matched with a dissertation supervisor and then they engage in regular meetings and discussions. We also hold a number of dissertation workshops to help students sort of navigate this research project. Now, some of the recent dissertation topics from our students include crisis diplomacy, a comparison of sort of American crisis management policies, um, Anglo-American relations and the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan in 79. Uh, some dissertations look at the United Nations, uh, for example, uh, some dissertations have also looked at uh, India, uh, Southeast Asia, uh, for example. So a number of dissertations according, you know, depending on your interests, and also uh, we match, as I say, with a supervisor to take you through the process. Next slide, please, Emma. 
Now, I would like to talk a little about uh, another aspect which is quite unique about this master's program, and that is our engagement with practitioners. So basically what we do is we bring academic expertise and practitioner experience. Now, students have met a number of ambassadors, diplomats, security experts. We also have links with the Foreign Office, the consular missions in Edinburgh, embassies in London, Paris, and Washington. Now, our practitioner masterclasses are very popular with our students, and because our students are able to engage with, uh, as I say, the experts, uh, such as Lord Ricketts, who was National Security Advisor to the Prime Minister. He was also Ambassador to France. Sir David Omand, former director of the UK intelligence agency, GCHQ, Dr. Olivia Gibner from the European Commission, and there are many others. And we are delighted that the Foreign Office has awarded this program a Commonwealth Shared Scholarship in recognition of the program's contribution to the scholarship themes, strengthening global peace, security, and governance. Now, this master's program will, of course, enhance your research skills, your ability to analyze large amounts of data and your presentation skills. But the relevance of this master's is obviously in the range of skills you can also develop. Now, diplomacy is about international relations, peace and security, but students also learn about negotiations, communications, conflict resolutions, treaties. Yes, we can learn about these and their application in the international arena, but these are also skills that students can apply to sort of their chosen careers. Similarly, decision-making, cooperation, partnerships, representation. So these are the skills that our students have been able to use in a range of careers. And you can see here some of our student successes and where, where our students have um, ended up. A number of international institutional institutions, intergovernmental organizations uh, in the UK civil service, uh, NGOs, banking and insurance, business analysis, and some of them have also gone on to do PhDs. So how do we prepare you for success? Um, by giving you a range of interesting and stimulating classes and by making this flexible so that you are, can take the classes that are relevant and of interest to you. Um, by giving you the opportunity to work on a research project of your choice, supported by your dissertation supervisor by giving you the opportunity to engage with diplomats and decision makers and benefit from their expertise. All this, and you can also enjoy, obviously, what Glasgow and Scotland have to offer. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much, Regalia, for joining us today. That was really informative. So we're now going to move on to our student and graduate panel. So I'm delighted to introduce um, Mike and Isabella who have joined us here today. Do you both want to introduce yourself? If you just want to introduce yourself, where you're from and what course you either studied or studying. So Isabella, do you want to go first? Sure, so my name is Isabella Benavides and I am from Houston, Texas. And I did my undergraduate degree in political science at the University of Houston, which is where Mark also um, did his PhD. And at the University of Strathclyde, I am doing an MSc in international relations. Thank you, Mike. Hi, uh, I'm Mike Bellis. Uh, I'm from Chicago, uh, where I currently am. Uh, and I graduated from the University of Michigan, where I studied political science and English literature. Um, and then I took a number of years off, and then I came back to school uh, at Strathclyde uh, with a degree in politics. And I took the qualitative route uh, all the way through, as uh, Dr. Shepard uh, was alluding to. So it is possible. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. So if I start with you, Mike, first, then, so why did you decide to do postgraduate degree and why did you pick Strathclyde? So I knew that I wanted to go to law school in the States. And I, as I mentioned, I was out of school for a number of years and I wanted to particularly focus on election law and uh, issues of kind of constitutional law and democracy and direct democracy initiatives and political parties, the role of the political process. Um, and I was very interested in what was going on with Brexit and how that interacted with Scottish independence. And I knew that I wanted to, to get a master's in, in Scotland and study this a little bit more closely before going to law school back in the States. 
Um, so this, it seemed like a, a perfect opportunity for me to explore those issues a little bit more closely and on the ground. Um, and I heard such fantastic things about the faculty and uh, it exceeded my expectations and it was a, a really just fantastic experience. Excellent, and Isabella? Yeah, so as I had mentioned, I did my undergraduate degree in political science and the university that I attended, it just so happened that the political science program was fairly broad. And for me, I was really looking to get more international relations related courses. So, you know, having a political science undergrad, I think there's a lot of talk of either doing a master's program or attending law school in order to get those higher ranking positions. So for me, I, I knew I needed to do a master's degree and I decided to go ahead and go about doing international relations. And for me, as to why I chose Strathclyde, um, I came across the University of Strathclyde back in 2019 when I was doing a semester abroad. I came up to Glasgow for a weekend trip and stumbled upon campus. And, you know, that was the first time that I finally kind of realized, you know, I can do a master's degree abroad and after doing research and as Mark had mentioned how the programs are typically shorter here um, that definitely kind of kind of sold me on it um, but in addition when looking at Strathclyde itself I very much valued that the information was put out on the website from the very beginning as to what it meant to be an international student as well as what it was to be an international relations postgraduate student um, and I really I really enjoyed the courses that um, I could have potentially been taking if I um, decided to attend Strathclyde. So, um, and then above all else, I, you know, I always had a lot of questions. I think any individual that's looking to do a degree abroad has a lot of questions and it's a huge financial investment as well. So um, whenever I would reach out to anyone at Strathclyde, it was always a prompt response, but more than anything, it was a positive response. And so um, I was really excited to be attending a university where I was going to get that personalized attention that you know you don't typically get at a larger public American university. And had you applied for other universities in the UK as well? Um, for myself, yes. So I applied to a total of three universities, um, one outside of Glasgow, but um, I was definitely excited about living in this city in particular. So I applied to Strathclyde and the University of Glasgow. Um, but again, I think this was the one university that I felt I was going to get that personalized care. You know, I think especially studying international relations, people do technically, you know, think more about the University of Glasgow, um, given that, you know, I guess, you know, Strathclyde is more of this STEM type of university, but um, at the end of the day, I, I love the courses. I looked into the faculty and specifically the research that they were doing. And um, ultimately that was just the decision that I made and I'm, and I'm really happy I, I did. Excellent, it's good to hear. And Mike, had you visited Scotland before you decided to apply to Strathclyde? I never had, um, but I had, you know, heard such great things about it, and I've had some friends uh, who had been and who had studied abroad, uh, both in Glasgow and in Edinburgh, and it seemed like something that it seemed like a place that I could really kind of get to know and uh, really enjoy living for for at least a year. Um, and I, as, as soon as I got there, I, I I really kind of fell in love with the city, and uh, it struck me as very similar to um, Chicago in some ways, and that it's like it's very international and, and multicultural and every neighborhood has its own personality which which I really appreciate and there's always things to do um, so I felt right at home right away and and to kind of echo what's been said about how friendly everyone is uh, I was made to feel right at home by both the university and my fellow students and, and some other people that I've met uh, very quickly and uh, it, it, it was just a kind of fantastic kind of onboarding process even in just my first few weeks there. Excellent, good. Um, so next question. So how did you find the workload compared to your undergraduate degree? And Mike, do you want to take that as well, please? Sure. So I, I think it is, it's different. So I think depending on what you're doing as an undergraduate, you're taking a variety of different courses. You have a major, um, I think with, at least in the, in the US system. Um, and with, at Strathclyde, I was a, an MSc in, in politics. It's a lot more reading. You are, you are kind of getting up to speed on, on where the literature in your subject has been at a, at a graduate level. So you're, you're really kind of taking on a lot of reading of the literature and, and, and understanding where the kind of the state of the art is and what it is that you're studying. 
And that takes a long time, but, but there is something that's really nice to kind of have your job essentially be reading all, you know, full time and really kind of mastering your subject so that you're ready to write that dissertation come the summertime. Um, and, and I will admit it was intimidating at first knowing that you know, I had to write a kind of original piece of scholarship at the beginning of the year. Uh, but you know, over the course of the courses that we took you know, between the first and second semesters, felt like I was really kind of prepared to do that. And I, and I was given kind of a really nice survey of, of, of coursework that really showed me what was out there in terms of where the literature was and in my subject areas, particularly around political parties. Um, and but by the time I wrote my dissertation, I was kind of ready to get started. And I had the methods training from um, the rest of the professors um, in, in the School of Public Policy that, that really kind of gave me the academic grounding that uh, I didn't have, you know, six, nine months before. So it, it was really kind of a, a new way to think about scholarship in a way that uh, I didn't engage at the level as an undergraduate, uh, but as a master's student, you, you quickly kind of assume the role uh, of engaging with literature more closely, uh, more holistically, and, and it, your writing skills and research skills really improve as a result. Excellent. Thank you, Isabella. I would definitely agree with Mike in the statement of reading does become your full-time job in a master's program. Um, you know, I, from my experience with my undergraduate degree, um, you're of course taking more courses, but more than anything, there's a lot more assignments. Um, and so it's a lot more fast paced in the sense of assignment after assignment. And I felt like a lot of the times it became more of this short-term memory type of situation and American undergraduate programs. So um, coming here, it was very refreshing, but also intimidating at first, I would say, um, because you are doing a lot of the reading and then you, know, you then go into class a few times a week and it's pretty much purely discussion. Um, so you definitely have to do the work, um, but I think it's just best to trust yourself trust that you know you got into this program for a reason that you're fully capable of doing the work and you know as long as you're responsible about it um, and keep up with the readings and not overthink it I think and I think um, most people can definitely handle it. Excellent and Mark kind of touched on it earlier about having the flexibility with your optional classes so did you find that and you were able to select classes that were of interest to yourself? For myself, yes. So, I mean, as it is, um, whenever I was looking at the classes that were compulsory, I was already excited to take those classes to begin with. But then you do, at least for, you know, the two semesters where you are in classes itself, you get the option of taking one elective each semester. And with that, I was also just able to kind of focus in on my interests. And so for me, like last semester, it was more security challenges related. And this semester it was feminism and international relations. And so, um, so yes, I, I feel like there is a great variety. And then as it is, you know, I have some some classmates that are taking law related classes as well. So, um, and then I remember coming into Strathclyde and emailing Mark briefly and him saying, you know, if there is a class outside of, you know, what is put out on the website, please let us know if you're interested in taking it so we can discuss how we could potentially make it work. Um, so you definitely do have this more customized degree plan. So did you find that as well, Mike? I did. So I, I took, um political parties right away with uh, Dr. Zach Green, who is, uh, I'd been corresponding with uh, before coming to Strathclyde. And he's a, a fantastic researcher in that area. Um, I, I'd learned uh, the principles of research design to kind of, as Dr. Shepard was, was speaking about earlier and, and kind of developing my dissertation idea. And uh, as he said, there is this kind of fantastic opportunity to see what other people are doing and you make posters and you, it's this big social event at the end of the semester, uh, which was very nice. Uh, but I also had the opportunity to, to take um, comparative public policy classes, um, classes about inst international institutions and regimes, European governance, um, all kind of giving me a little bit more of a backing in European governmental systems and, and the way that these institutions worked uh, that I was less familiar with coming from the United States. You know, we have a very different system um, that's much more kind of federal and, and states based. Um, so it was informative to me as I knew that I wanted to research how Scotland and the UK uh, kind of interacted and how the parties were, were grappling with 
more European and, and domestic issues in the UK. So for me, it was, it was kind of a, a great opportunity to kind of to, uh, to get the, the full picture of what was going on. And uh, all the professors were, were extremely patient and uh, the classes were much more intimate and, and smaller in a way that uh, wasn't always the case in undergrad for me anyway. Um, and I, I really appreciated kind of that more one-on-one uh, -on -one attention and, and just the opportunity to really engage closely with the material and with the professors and, and the fellow students in, in each of the classes. So I think each, each one had something to offer. Um, and, you know, on the whole, it, it really kind of prepared me to, to write my own dissertation come the summer. Excellent. Okay, so what advice would you offer students that are about to start their postgraduate degree or just still thinking about undertaking postgraduate study? Mike, do you want to carry on? Sure. So I think, um, you know, go go easy at first and, and just kind of allow yourself to get adjusted to living in the new city if you're not from Glasgow. Um, I think there there's so much that you, both the university and the city have to offer that it's, it's really worth kind of exploring that uh, almost first and Kind of easing yourself into your studies because it will be you know an intense year if it's a one-year master's program uh, but you will have time to do it and i think uh, you'll be able to to really kind of um, learn how to manage your schedule in a way where your studies are integrated uh, not just like a work day but in, in into your life uh, in glasgow and, and as a student um, and, and i would encourage everybody to um, really make that as integral a part of your experience as possible just living in the city and and taking advantage of all the opportunities, cultural, um, you know, in nature, just surrounding just outside the city, um, and, and just everything in Scotland has to offer. I think there's, there's really a lot there that extends beyond just the master's program, um, if you need a break from reading, uh, which, which inevitably you might. Um, but I think it was a, a fantastic experience that is, that is worth, um, you know, taking on the whole and, and taking your time with and um, being patient with yourself to kind of uh, know that you will be producing great work and you will be surrounded by a, a really great support system in the university and your professors um, and fellow students that will that will really kind of situate you well. Excellent. Um, Isabella? For myself, I would say, you know, really try to focus on work-life balance, especially from the very beginning, because, you know, the first three weeks, I will say, um, are sort of relaxed. And I, I very much appreciated that for my professors, just kind of giving time for all students to adjust, but uh, you know, shortly thereafter, it will, it will pick up um, quite quickly. So um, stay on top of things. And more importantly, just ask questions, especially being an international student. Um, it can be a crazy time if you allow it to be that way. So, um, you know, Strathclyde has a very strong support system in place to take advantage of the university resources, take time to explore campus, go to the social events that are available. And then as it is, you know, you, you're living in such an amazing city, a very, um, in my opinion, budget friendly um, city for students. So um, just explore and, and have a good time and, um, and just keep, keep on track with your responsibilities. <laughs> Um, you've both kind of touched on this already about how easy you found it settling into Glasgow and the university from coming from abroad, but did either of you kind of stay on campus or did you do private accommodation and how easy was it for you to find um, the accommodation? Um, Isabella, do you want to, since yeah. you hadn't? Mm -hmm. for, um, so for me, I decided to go with private student accommodation, but the accommodation that I picked is actually right across the street from the library and Strathsport. So it's in the best location, I feel, um, especially for like those late night um, library study sessions. You can just walk back within like two minutes and be in your bed <laughs> in, in no, no time. Um, but when coming here for the first time, you know, I came once COVID had already started, um, I mean, I, I started this past academic year, so we were kind of in and out of it, um, but I very much felt like, you know, the city had the precautions in place, the university as well, to make it as enjoyable of, as, of an experience as possible, as realistic as possible, um, but at the same time, keeping us all safe. And so for me, that was that was a big concern that I had coming into it. So um, automatically feeling very welcomed and then also having that safety component added to it um, just made, made adjusting here very seamless. 
And are you um, face to face classes now or are you still doing a mixture? So um, that's that's one of the great things that I've really enjoyed about my time at Strathclyde. So the first semester, two out of the three classes that I had were online. And then the one one in person class I did have was incredibly small. So it was a very safe environment. But, you know, I last semester I was actually a class representative for one of my classes. And, you know, once a semester, um, all the class representatives get together with the professors and the program director and discuss where we would like to see change. And a lot of the students were saying, you know, we think it's time and it would be beneficial to go back in person. A lot of us are ready for that. And so that feedback was, you know, really taken into account and it was made possible to where, you know, this semester I have all of my classes in person. Again, taking those safety precautions and of course following government guidelines, but it's made for, you um, for a, a great experience, both online and in person. I felt like my professors went the extra mile to give us the best learning experience possible. And now it's even um, better being in person and being able to interact with my peers face-to-face -face and being able to go for lunch in between classes and going out after class. So it's it's been a great experience. Excellent. And Mike, did, how did you find settling into Glasgow when you were here? Uh, I thought it was very easy for me. I lived in the, the student halls in, in James Young Hall for the graduates. So uh, I had a great living situation where I, I was with other international students, another student from the US, uh, students from Germany, Hong Kong, Brazil. Um, it, it was really just a, 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 an amazing kind of opportunity to meet a very diverse amount of roommates and, and just other students at the university doing completely different uh, areas of the school uh, in master's programs. Uh, so, so that was really great. And I graduated in 2020. So I was actually in uh, Glasgow when the lockdown started and, and COVID kind of began. And we initially, you know, had transferred to uh, online classes in, in March 2020, I guess about two years ago at this point. And I, I will say I elected to stay in Glasgow because I felt so comfortable there. And I think the university did such an ad admirable job, as well as all my professors, transitioning onto online classes, you know, navigating all of it as it was happening. You know, there was a lot of unknowns uh, at the time, but we were able to not only finish the classes, but I stayed, you know, in the halls throughout that spring and summer, and, and I felt very comfortable doing so. Um, I, you know, the, the university was incredibly supportive through those kind of early, more kind of uncertain days of the pandemic, but um, I was happy to have the opportunity to, to stay in Glasgow through that because I felt um, you know, very well supported and, and, and safe throughout the entire time. I was sad to leave, uh, but I, I'm back in the U.S. now and uh, I'm, I wouldn't have done it a different way. I think it was a very um, seamless kind of not only transition into Glasgow and, and into the student halls and, and getting integrated, um, not only with, you know, fellow master's students, but just the rest of the professors and, and other friends of friends living in the city. Uh, but by the time that I had left, I'd, I'd already felt so integrated. Um, as a Glaswegian that it was it was very difficult to leave so. We get quite a lot of questions about um, applying for the visa so can maybe Isabella you've done it most recently and um, can you offer any guidance or advice for anybody that's thinking about coming over what the process is for applying for their student visa? Great. So um, for me I had the unique experience of having been accepted um, right when right right when COVID had started, and I planned to attend last year, last academic year, but due to COVID, I decided to defer because you know I was sort of concerned as to what the experience was going to be. Not because I doubted Strathclyde in any way, but just more with government guidelines in place, what my as time abroad was going to look like. But um, when it was time to actually start the visa application process, I got, you know, I was able to get that information pretty early on, um, had the opportunity to fill out the paperwork relatively quickly. Um, and, you know, I did have a lot of questions along the way. And Melissa Cunningham will tell you, I was, I was in her inbox probably every single week. <laughs> um, but again, um, that's what they're there for is to answer those questions. And so I was able to get a lot of helpful feedback and move through the process um, within a few weeks time. And, you know, 
for me, I was fortunate enough to have received my visa within a week's time of sending in all the paperwork and doing my visa appointment, which I will say is a very rare situation. Um, so really take into account the guidance that the university is giving you as well as what the government is giving you as well. Um, don't don't drag your feet on it just as soon as you get it, get started on it that way you know, whenever it's coming time to move over here, you can book your flight with plenty of time, book your student accommodation and not have these things hanging over your head. Um, but overall, I will say it was it was a relatively easy process as long as um, you don't allow it to to sit there for too long. Excellent. And Mike, how did you find the process? Uh, there were more steps in it than I had anticipated. So I think allowing yourself the extra time to make sure that you are tracking down each aspect of the, your paperwork and, and coordinating with, with Melissa and the rest of the administrative staff at the university. I think uh, they are ready to help you with that. They certainly helped me out when I knew very little about the whole process and, and how it you know, relayed with admission to the university. So learning kind of how to do all of that um, with help, with, with a lot of help from the university and making that happen. Um, it, was, it was pretty seamless, I will say. It, 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 I don't think it took me uh, quite as quickly as a week, but um, it was certainly, um, you know, not as difficult as I had anticipated at the outset. So I, th I think it is, it may seem intimidating at first, but, um, you know, everything is, is there to kind of make it happen for you. So I, and I think Melissa and the rest of the staff really kind of go the extra mile to make sure that all your paperwork is submitted uh, and that everything is accurate and that you have everything you need to kind of get started without an issue. Excellent. Thank you. So final question. Um, I'll direct this to yourself, Mike, as you have um, graduated. So how did you find your postgraduate um, degree enhanced your career and your career prospects? Because you're at law school now. I am. So I'm, I'm back at law school in the States. I went straight into law school after graduating, uh, which is which is a very different type of school, uh, certainly in the States. But um, for me, knowing that I wanted to be kind of more at the intersection of politics and law, uh, with election law, voting rights uh, in the States, uh, it was a fantastic opportunity from an academic perspective to kind of reorient my thinking at the graduate level toward research and, and certainly being a full-time reader, uh, law school is, is that and then some. And it really kind of acclimated me to a higher level of scholarship um, that I, I would not have had the, the same kind of level of comfort um, entering um, law school doing that. Um, and, you know, I've, I've had to write some longer articles and papers for, for our school's law review, uh, which you know is very similar to the dissertation writing process. And it would have been a lot more intimidating, I think, if I didn't have that prior training in really kind of a deep dive in academic original research um, that the dissertation gave me. So I think it really set me up to be comfortable at a higher level of scholarship than that I certainly wouldn't have been otherwise. And I think after I graduate law school, I'll have this extra experience to draw upon, not only as an international, student, uh, but knowing that, you know, I might want to do things in comparative constitutional law, and specifically with the UK, it's just this, it's this fantastic kind of academic backing that will really enhance my American law school uh, education in a way that is really unique, and uh, that, that I really value. Excellent. And Isabella, what are your plans once you complete your degree? That's the big question, of course, <laughs> going, going into a postgraduate degree or any degree for that matter. Um, but for myself, um, I'm kind of torn 50-50 as whether or not I would like to stay in the UK or go back home to the US. But, you know, I'm flexible and wherever I end up, I'll be completely happy. But for myself, I'm really interested in working in the UK political system. I've had some prior experience working in British politics through an internship I did during my semester abroad. So that's something that definitely interests me or moving back home and working for an NGO of some sort. Um, but, you know, I'm definitely looking forward to taking advantage of the career services at the University of Strathclyde very soon. But more than anything um, that I've found as a pleasant surprise is that, you know, within my cohort, there's a mix of students, some students that have gone straight from their undergraduate degree into a postgraduate degree, but others that are currently working throughout their program or have worked for quite some time and are now students. So especially now being face to face, um, we've we've had a lot of conversations about what the next few months is going to mean for us. And so it's been great to be able to share with one another job openings that we see, um, you know, and 
pass around resumes and just in case something pops up. So I definitely feel again, like that is something that Strathclyde definitely brings is this very unique support system um, and very much fosters that within their students. And so um, I, I trust that I'm definitely gonna end up in the right place. Excellent.